Welcome to Arts World, a podcast showcasing artists and arts organizations talking about the role of the arts today in Greater Lansing. I'm Robin Miner Swartz. I'm an editor, communications consultant, and an arts advocate. And today I'm talking with Jessie Gregg, a shopkeeper, abstract fiber artist, and East Lansing City Council member. She's been part of the Greater Lansing art scene since 2000 as an exhibiting artist and now the owner of Seams Fabric Store in downtown East Lansing, where she also teaches fiber art classes. Hi, Jessie. Welcome to the Arts Council Roll Call. Hey Robin, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with the Arts Council of Greater Lansing and how you became a member. Um, I think I have been kind of swirling in the same um, pool, I guess, as the Arts Council and aware of the things that they were doing, but it wasn't actually until I became a shopkeeper that I became a member um, as an artist. And I think this is one of the things that I've chatted with with um, different arts advocates around town about is just, you know, artists don't have a lot of disposable income. So, um, it, you know, it's a critical, it's a critical role, um, but it wasn't until I kind of moved into a slightly different career path that I was actually able to take advantage of it. So um, I think, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. That's the unfortunate economic reality of being a working artist. Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you wear several hats. It seems to be they're very different hats, um, but you in, you intersect in the community in a whole lot of ways. So uh, you're a textile artist, you're a shop owner, which we just talked about. You're the city of East Lansing's mayor pro tem, I understand. <laughs> yes, my, my and, weird, mostly meaningless title, but that's okay. <laughs> great. And, and you're also a member of the city of East Lansing's Arts Commission. So yes. let's start with artists. When did your love for fabrics and sewing begin? I have been around fabric for as long as I can remember. Um, I wish I knew exactly how old I was when my mom sat me down in front of a sewing machine, but it was, um, the machine was an old uh, cast iron singer, one step up from a treadle sewing machine, it went forward, it's, it went backwards and that was it. And I remember being given like a rag basket, basically full of old denim from old jeans and just kind of given the run of the sewing machine and uh, made some just absolutely appalling pot holders that, you know, my mother was forced to treasure run created <laughs> by her beloved child. Um, but yeah, since then, I think I, in high school, I didn't really have, um, you know, kind of a traditional after school job. I did costume design for my own um, high school theater program and also for other high school theater programs. And I was really active in the summer in a summer arts camp up in Fargo, North Dakota, that um, was kind of the hangout of a lot of us theater geek kids during the summer. Um, so I've always kind of just been around textiles and around art. Weirdly, when I went to school, um, I thought that I was going to go, to go into costume and design because that's what I had been doing. But um, after about a year in the theater program, I just decided I wanted a little bit more creative freedom and moved into a fine art program and um, liked my school, even though they did not have a textile art program. So I ended up in a traditional art program um, with uh, doing intaglio printmaking and bronze casting, which is about as far from fiber art as you could possibly get. Yeah. But then after graduation, kind of returned to textiles because I oddly did not have a foundry in my backyard, but I did have a screen. So <laughs> it's, kind of a, it's been a meandering path, but <laughs> here we are. Well, where did the idea for the store come from then? Because it's one thing to produce your own art, but it's another to then help other people not only have the materials and the supplies, but the skills to do the same kinds of things. Yeah, I think so. When I first moved to town, I actually got a job at a really traditional quilt store, which was the first time that I had worked in a retail environment that was, you know, creative focused and really found that just kind of being surrounded by the tools of my trade all day was very inspirational. So I love, and I've always really, um, I've always really enjoyed those inspirational spaces. You know, if you, if you have writer's block, go to a library, go to a bookstore. If you have artist's block, go to an art supply store. If you have, you know, sewing block, go to a sewing supply store. And um, so I just, I've always found these environments to be really inspirational. And then when my kids, so I had, you know, so I was working in textile art. I was working as a fiber artist doing um, local exhibitions, gallery shows and art fairs. And then I sort of switched my creative journey to having children, which is, you know, kind of the- One it's of, own creative journey. <laughs> one of many interesting performance art projects that um, <laughs> embark on in their lives. 
But so for about eight years, I was really very wrapped up with having small children. I've got three kids two years apart, and that was pretty zooming. Um, and when I kind of came out the other side of it, I thought that I would get back to sewing, um, get back to some of my textile um, clothing sewing roots that I hadn't been involved with for a while. And I just couldn't find any fabric that I wanted to sew with locally. There was a very vibrant online textile community. There's a lot of um, new designers. There's a lot of um, exciting surface pattern design happening. And a lot of it's being promoted through social media platforms. Instagram is really heavy with sewists. Um, but I wasn't finding anything locally that I wanted to sew with. And I think as a tactile person, as a textile person, to me, it's really pretty critical to have your hands on your materials before you okay. actually decide what you want to do with them. And then um, knowing too, just that um, having people available to help you, to, to me, the critical thing as a sewing teacher is I want to get you through your first project. I want to get you through you know, that, that critical learning phase. And I want you to leave with a garment that you're proud of. And I think having a teacher involved in that process, it makes it much more sure that that is actually going to happen. Um, muddling through things on your own, even in this age of um, YouTube, where there's just every tutorial that you could imagine. Um, it's a great time to learn new skills and great time to learn new habits, but having an in-person instructor is just really um, kind of, uh, you can't replace that. So if I could provide a space to be that inspiring shop, to be that on location expert to help people through those kind of first steps, then um, I thought that that was, that was a niche that I could fill. And then I think the critical final component of that was the collaboration that I have with Woven Art, um, who's a, she's a, it's, the shop has had two different owners um, and I've been friends with both of them and I've been connected with both, with both owners as they've grown their businesses. Um, the current owner is named Meg Croft and she and I have been, we, we both work, we were co-workers at Woven Art but under the previous owner. And so we've always had this kind of like fantasy dialogue of like, wouldn't it be great if I opened a fabric store next door? And then the gallery that was occupying this space decided not to renew their lease, which was, you know, obviously very, a sad loss to the community, but it was kind of a unmissable green light in terms of my journey um, to, to take over this spot. So I actually have, I have the storefront, um, but I don't occupy the full depth of the retail bay. I'm only about 500 square feet here, actually more like 350. Um, I've crammed a huge amount of fabric into that 350 square feet, but I still have a very small space. And then the rest of the space behind me is actually occupied by woven art. So I think having, and I guess that's, you know, we can return to that theme when we start talking about local art too, but collaboration. Um, okay an amazing way to kind of magnify your resources and magnify your voice. So that was really the kind of the absolute boot out the door <laughs> was no that I had, you know, that I had a good home, that I had a small shop that I could um, kind of personally risk the overhead on this store while the, while the store was getting going, I could, you know, kind of personally absorb that loss if I had to, which I haven't had to, which is great. Um, and then I had a, a, you know, a sympathetic business owner next door to kind of share resources with and as I grow. So, um, yeah, it's been a pretty, it's been a pretty amazing journey. That's fantastic. Well, so in your role in the city council, you've said making more opportunities for small business is important to you. So in this current economic situation and the pandemic and everything that we're, we're battling right now, we're seeing a big push to shop local. So how has that impacted your shop and what are some good reasons for people to be doing this very local, local support? Yeah, I think one of the things that happens when you shop local is that your money goes directly back into the economy. So like my internet provider is a local business. Um, you know, I leave here and I go grab lunch from a local business. My kids are, you know, outfitted with um, clothing from local businesses. And so just the dollars that you spend with a shopkeeper that lives in your town stay much more in your town. I mean, some of it goes to my mortgage or whatever, but like um, just, but you know, it kind of magnifies that, that impact of that dollar. So 
if you, um, I'm not going to call out any um, megalopolis retailers by name, but if you, if you, you know, if you go, you know, pick up your toilet paper from a, um, maybe an online subscription service or something like that, um, you know, the money goes into the economy, but it doesn't go into your local economy as, t as neatly as it does if you spend it at a local shop. So, um, even, even if you're spending, even if you're, you know, supporting a national branded retailer, but you're doing it through the local shop, the people who are getting there and earning wages are local. So it's, um, it really is a critical part of supporting our, our local community and economy. Oh, absolutely. Well, you talked a little bit about collaboration in your shop. And so you do work with other artists and arts organizations for what you're working on. And I know you've also partnered with Peppermint <laughs> Creek Theater um, for a mask making fundraiser. Can you talk a little bit about that collaboration and what the outcome was for both you and Peppermint Creek? Yeah, um, well, I can tell you what the outcome was for us. So that kind of um, that hit. Gosh, I mean, this whole tidal wave of um, of the pandemic and the masks, the way that it came on was just so fast. And we were all kind of trying to adapt to what, I mean, we, the, our, as a retailer, my store was closed. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to understand where, what are, what allowed things we were able to do in the store. And I kind of took a more conservative interpretation of the shutdown orders and decided that that meant that I really should not be in the store at all. So, I had kind of, when my kids' school got closed down, I kind of anticipated that the next thing might be that the, the storefronts were closed. And so I had taken um, a lot of our um, inventory home with me, um, more, more so like shop samples and things that I thought I was going to be able to work on. But I had grabbed some of the mask supplies as well because that had kind of seemed like it might become a, you know, become a bigger, more important part of what was happening. So I had my elastic at home with me and I had, you know, um, most of the cotton from our discounted area was home with me. And I had been just kind of giving it away. We had set up a, um, a contact free distribution point on my front porch. People who didn't want to sew masks had been dropping off cotton fabric. I was sort of bundling things up in little kind of go bags um, so that people could grab things without having to, to interact with anybody. Um, but at that point, it was really more like hospitals and nursing homes. And it, there was kind of a hint on the horizon that it might become more of a, of a national requirement. And I think that's kind of where when Peppermint Creek found me was I was kind of trying to decide how much I could continue to do as a business owner, because I was sort of beyond the point where I could absorb that financial loss. Mm -hmm because I was giving giving stuff away and people had been dropping off donations and stuff like that. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't doing badly, but I couldn't really scale up what we were doing because I didn't have the, you know, the finances to do that. So um, Peppermint Creek, actually one of their board members approached me and asked if I would be willing to be the beneficiary of this fundraiser. And at first I told her no, because I didn't really know what I would spend the money on. Um, and then as things ramped up and it just became more apparent that, there, that the need was growing instead of diminishing, I said, okay, you know, and I was expecting, you know, 500 bucks or 600 bucks or something like that. And they ended up raising about $7,000, wow. which was a staggering quantity to me, but it, it allowed me to really outfit the people, the volunteers that were sewing you know, at that point, two months into production, people's rotary cutters were breaking, their needles were breaking. They couldn't get thread. Um, it was just, you know, so I was able to not just um, not just order. So I was able to order new fabric. You know, I ordered kind of plain prints and things that were a little bit more affordable. So I didn't have to sort through these like bins of <laughs> supplies, which was becoming quite labor intensive. Um, and then I was able to provide them with other tools that they needed to keep going. So, um, you know, cutting blades, scissors. Um, thread elastic was the elastic we so <laughs> that's I think that's kind of why people found me is because I was managing to keep elastic in stock uh, more <laughs> than other other local stores had been I deal with um manufacturing wholesalers as opposed to craft supply wholesalers because my garment focus really puts me more in it's a different supply stream so I was able to basically order cases of elastic direct from factories in China because I had that as part of my supply chain. 
And so, um, yeah, so we were joking about the black market elastic economy. Um, I think, Real thing. <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, in terms of what, what Peppermint Creek got out of the deal, I mean, I guess I kind of feel like I got more than they did. But the way that their um, the way that their event was set up, it was a really kind of um, I think you know cast yourself back to March and April when we were shut into our houses. Um, there was a lot of fear because nobody really knew how the virus was being transmitted. It was you know people were keeping their groceries in their in their um, garage for three days and wiping everything down with hand sanitizer, and a lot of just kind of a, a huge amount of anxiety. And so what they had done is they called on their network of current and past performers, and they put together this program of people from all over the country. It wasn't just performers in the Lansing area. And it, so it was people who had had a connection to the theater at some point, but had maybe moved on. And so for them, it was really, um, it was a national kind of audience. And it was this way to connect with people that had been um, connected to the theater, but had maybe not had a chance to, to check in with them lately. So. I think, you know, in terms of what really, and, and the mask making as well, it was all just kind of fueled by this need to connect with people when we were physically so isolated. And then just kind of any, any type of um, way that we could deflect that fear and anxiety. And so for the sewing, you know, for the sewist, it was more production and feeling useful and putting things out to help people. Um, but that performance and joy and coming together is part of it as well, mm -hmm. human experience. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a huge benefit to us. We we lost track of how many masks we were sewing. And a lot of the people that were kind of connected to me through our Facebook page were connected with local like church sewing groups and things like that. So I don't want to take personal credit for and I mean, I don't, want, I don't want to take credit for anything that they sold, but the number that we we could kind of had people self-report how many they had sold or sold, not sold. They were all given away. Um, and we lost track at about 15,000 and that was months ago. And I've sent out thousands since then. So, uh, I mean, somewhere in the somewhere in the 20,000, you know, range of, of these individual hands on masks that were distributed. So it was a it was a pretty, pretty incredible thing to be part of. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, what, what about the how you've had to shift everything during the pandemic has surprised you the most? What have you learned as a business owner and as an artist about how to adapt in this space? Yeah, well, we, we have been kind of, so I started very small because I had the opportunity to move into this um, storefront really before I financially had the inventory to fill the storefront. And so people who came in, we opened in April of 2019 and we had, you know, we had our nice little decal on the window and I was here at regular hours, but I was kind of mostly using it as an office. I was writing and doing other things while I was here. And if somebody came in, I would sell them something. And we were still doing our classes and stuff like that. But I had maybe like 80 bolts of fabric. It was a very, very tiny inventory. Um, and then over the last year and a half, April was our one year anniversary, which is of course very bittersweet because we were closed because mm -hmm. of the lockdown. Um, and then when I came back, um, when I was able to open up in May, there was just this incredible demand for a very specific type of fabric, which was this kind of printed cotton weight fabric, um, the quilt, quilt cottons, um, which is what people were using for the masks. And so for me, I was selling much more than I had been before, but of a very, very small part of my inventory. Mm -hmm. and because the um because the supply chains were all backed up and everything was really muddled up in manufacturing i wasn't really able to get exactly the type of fabric that i wanted that's not really how the fabric supply chain works and so i kind of was like panic ordering things that were you know i opened accounts with lots of new vendors and i kind of had them ship me basically whatever they had in the warehouse and it was um it was very chaotic <laughs> i had I were a bookkeeper, which I had not had to do before because we just weren't doing the volume of work that warranted it. But those, you know, um, so Mar March and April, I was ordering wholesale, having it shipped to my house and then giving it away as quickly as possible. And then I had these other weird cash deposits coming in that were donations that were not connected to my inventory. And then in, in May, 
I just started placing these like huge orders for fabric that I wasn't sure if I was going to see it or not. And so my books are just an absolute mess. So God, the bookkeeper who's coming in and sorting all of that out for me. And then um, I, you know, and at that point I hadn't brought any of my staff back, but as we kind of continued and sort of kind of took the temperature of, of the, um, not to use a medical metaphor, but kind of sense the, the, the way that the virus was moving through the community and kind of realizing that this was not a temporary situation, but we really had to kind of adapt to this distanced um, environment. And so at that point, we really switched and put all of our energy into getting our inventory digitized and onto a website so that we could do um, web-based orders, which I had technically had the ability to do before but there just wasn't really anything on the website and the stuff that was on the website was kind of miscategorized and it didn't have thumbnails and it was kind of it was it was pretty much a mess so really since about june i would say that's about 80 percent of the energy that we're putting into the store is managing the website getting it up taking pictures you know kind of trying one method of categorizing something realizing that it didn't work and then having to <laughs> do everything but at this point, um, I haven't run a report recently, but I would say about 75% of our business is happening through the web portal, um, even local business. We're doing a lot of curbside. Um, I'm doing some local delivery. Um, and then we do have people that come in, but it's a much smaller part mm -hmm. of our business. So usually when there's somebody in the shop, they're cutting orders um, that have come in through the website and then really only waiting on people in person. And then um, a part, you know, a big part of my kind of business plan opening up was this idea of teaching classes. Um, garment sewing as a hobby is kind of experiencing a little bit of a renaissance, but you've got a lot of people who are interested in it, but have never had a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. So teaching classes is kind of a critical part of our business plan because <laughs> we need to create the sewers so that we can sell them. <laughs> And we can't do that right now. So I think the next phase of our business development is going to be looking at video production and video tutorials. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be, <laughs> you know, it's going to be, I think I had a lot of, um, whenever you start a business, you kind of have a perfect idea in your mind of what you want it to be. And then that can really become very limiting. So like our website was chaotic because I hadn't, I wasn't able to make it what I perfectly wanted it to be. And I had this idea that I wanted to like put it out as a complete package and be like, here it is, it's beautiful, right? And so then this um, this situation hit where we really couldn't do that. <laughs> we had to sort of be like, here's our website. It's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Please shop here. <laughs> find what you need, like call us because, right. um, yeah. So, and I think that our video production is probably going to be the same way. You know, it's going to be like, you know, my cell phone and we're going to try a few things that work and see how it goes and get feedback from our community. Um, but what I've found is that at least our customers, and I expect that this is true of other small businesses as well, our customers are very gracious and they're very willing to let us, um, you know, kind of use them for market research. And um, they're very supportive <laughs> when we try something new, even if it doesn't exactly work out. So, um, and they're also, you know, and they'll give us good feedback so that we can make it better the next time. So right. um, I think I do have a kind of a fun collaboration coming up with the Broad Art Lab. We're going to start supplying their sewing area in their studio with some of our supplies. And I'm going to film a couple of kind of, um, I do a private lesson where you can come in for an hour and I'll walk you through your sewing machine and kind of do all the different parts of the sewing machine and um, kind of explain to you some, um, some very common beginner mistakes that happen and how to prevent them from happening. So I'm going to film a version of that for them so that they can have that available as part of their studio space for people who want to use their sewing machines. Um, and we'll kind of, we'll see how that goes. And then, um, you know, if there's more content, then we might create some more of those. Um, and then I think the other, the other fun collaboration that's happening is I've got a couple of local designers. Um, there's, uh, locally, there's a woman named Sarah Surface Evans, whose um, company is called Downy Tree Art, and she's been taking some of her artwork and having it printed on canvas for to be embroidered. So we're, we're stocking her kits, and I've got another artist out of Grand Rapids doing the same thing, Dana Walton from Solstice Handmade. We've got her kits as well. 
So I think we're always looking for just different ways that we can, I, <laughs> um, I've always, I guess I've always sort of found myself in areas of art that are denigrated as craft, as if that sort of lessens them somehow. And I think now as a craft retailer and as a craft, um, you know, teacher and promoter, I'm kind of leaning into that difference. And I'm, you know, looking for ways to involve fine art in quotation marks with my craft art in any way that I possibly can and kind of really just sort of demonstrate by example that that line is not as firm as people believe it to be and that maybe we should get over ourselves a little bit. So that's been really fun. Um, hoping maybe to start doing some, de some designing. We'd love to have an in-house brand of patterns. That's kind of a far reach maybe. Um, but yeah, there's lots of, lots of possible <laughs> pathways into the future. Well, as a creative small business owner, what is something you wish you knew when you were getting up and running? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I guess this is going back to some conversations that I've had both with, um, with Megan Martin, the director of the Arts Council, and with her predecessor. Um, I think we, we really do not do our creative, um, our creative people a favor by um, failing to admit that art is a business. I think every, every artist is a small business person, whether or not they want to be. <laughs> I mean, like creating the art is just one part of it, promoting it and selling it is another part of it. And so really, as soon as you start to sell your artwork, um, you know, then you, then you are a business and you have the responsibilities that a business has. So, you know, bookkeeping, tax records, um, and that kind of thing. I think a lot, a lot of creative businesses start out without really a plan of how to take care of that stuff. And I was definitely guilty of it. Um, kind of assuming that like when, when the bill comes due, I'll figure out what I owe and how I owe. And that's not, not exactly how treasury work. You kind of, kind of got to keep up with that. So, um, you know, if you're paying sales tax, you got to pay that in and you got to keep track of it and all that sort of stuff. So, um, I think, yeah, not, not minimizing that and kind of leaning into that and being like, you know, you're creative people and this isn't your thing. Although some people are, I know some businesses that are just, you know, some artists that are incredible business people, um, you know, inspire the rest of us and tell us how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Um, but if you, you know, if you recognize that that's a fault in yourself, then you have to figure out a way to, to hire somebody or to outsource that or to, you know, collaborate or barter for those services um, because it's gonna bite you in the butt if you don't take care of it. Um, tax man, yeah, tax man wants his, wants his dues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but even, you know, I think even in terms of like, obviously I'm a store and I have suppliers and I, my bills are, you know, I know when they, it looks like a bill when it comes cause it, you know, it's my internet bill. But I think even as, and I think this is something that I've had a, um, Going back to that idea of craft versus art, right? We've got um, highly skilled and highly technical time consuming work that we don't compensate properly. And so even if you're a small business person that's doing, you know, zipper pouches or baby backpacks or, you know, um, whatever you're producing, Approaching it like a business and really looking at your profit and loss um, and really honestly acknowledging what went into that project. So, you know, and I have this conversation all the time and I've actually started being kind of middleman because I'll see people will post on our page like, oh, I need I want to have all of these quilts made into a T-shirt. Does anybody know who does that? Kind of, you know, somebody else will say, oh, I might be able to take it on. And then I'll kind of like gently message that person and be like, so what are you charging for that service? Okay. You know, she's like, oh, I don't know, 50 bucks. I'm like, mm, how about 150 bucks? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, uh, oh, really? You think? I'm like, well, you know, and she's like, I already have the material. So it's not going to cost me anything. I'm like, that material costs you something. I don't care if it's been sitting in the back of your closet for 20 years. Like, there's value to that. And also, like, your closet, right? You're storing it. Like, you okay. have overhead, even if you don't recognize it. And also you're not doing any other small business person a favor by cutting your prices, right? So um, we kind of have to, I don't know, <laughs> we, it's impossible to get everyone to agree on what to price their stuff at. But I think, you know, 
having people that are kind of willing to talk about why things cost the way they are makes mm-hmm. the conversation much easier for other people. Um, and I, I always give the example of the $5 t-shirt and, you know, cause you can walk into Walmart or, you know, some of our other big retailers and you can get a t-shirt for $5 off the clearance rack. But what you're missing in that $5 t-shirt, it's not the cost of the materials because the materials at that volume don't cost very much. You're missing the cost of the labor and you're missing the human cost behind that. Mm-hmm. The, the difference in cost between a $50 t-shirt and a $5 t-shirt is who was sewing it for you and what they got paid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you as an artist, like don't be the $5 t-shirt. You need to be the $50 t-shirt because otherwise, you know, the thing that you're using up is yourself and you can't keep going at that rate. So um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> know what you're worth and charge what you're worth, I guess is my kind of, um, but then, and also, you know, just acknowledge, acknowledge that your overhead is not just your materials, that there's a lot more that goes into that, including your skill and, you know, the bills on your studio space, even if it's in your house, it's part of your house that you're paying a mortgage on. So include that in your cost. That is super valuable. Thank you for giving that TED talk because it was yeah. really, it's really, really key for people to yeah. understand about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> and so folks can then find you online at seamsfabric.com now, right? Yeah. Yep, seamsfabric.com. We have a Facebook page that's just under seams, S-E-A-M-S, like a fabric seam. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have a community page, which is where my customers kind of share their projects and get advice and things like that, which is under seams, comma, classes and community. Um, and that's, that's really where all the mask, um, mask organizing happens. So that kind of, that group kind of exploded with people, but it's a really active, fun community now. And people, um, share still a lot of masks, but also other things that they're working on as well. So there's, and then we're on Instagram as well. That seems fabric. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I've learned a ton from you today, (laughs) Jesse. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no problem. (laughs) I am happy happy to rant on many subjects. (laughs) Well, you're you're ranting with expertise, which is always a really great part of it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> it. It was oh yeah. <laughs> this podcast has been a production of the Arts Council of Greater Lansing. To learn more about them, go to lansingarts.org.